name's Andrew McColl. I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice. And it is our pleasure today to welcome to our family Zoom, John Steenhoff. John is the principal lawyer at the Human Rights Law Alliance that specialises in religious liberty and freedom of thought, speech and conscience. He's a father of six and John's had 20 years experience in law prior to the establishment of the Human Rights Law Alliance in 2019. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Andrew. A pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So, John, what was it that got you started in the Human Rights Law Alliance? Well, it's a, it's a journey, Andrew, that has been very incremental. So when I first studied law as a young man in New Zealand, uh, I had no idea that I was going to end up uh, practicing doing religious freedom law. Indeed, straight out of law school, I uh, went and worked for a large commercial law firm, but I had been brought up by good, godly Christian parents, and they had raised me to look at my vocation as more than just a way of making money, but a place where I have to find my kingdom calling. So uh, in about 2006, I moved to Western Australia and ended up in my own law firms, again, doing commercial work. But I was seeing more and more Christians who were facing hostility for their faith. And when they faced legal action, they would often cast around to find someone to help them. And there were not very many people who would do so. So in my own practice, I, I took on a number of pro bono cases for, for people who were facing hostility for their faith or where faith institutions were getting in trouble. Uh, one of the very early cases that we took on was that of Shalom House in Western Australia. This was a Christian drug rehab center where the neighbors had objected and wanted to get them removed. And the local planning department of the city council uh, even though they supported it, the city council themselves uh, tried to make them move out. So we took a, a long and arduous case on their behalf in, in my previous law firm, arguing uh, that they were what they were doing was a, um, a in accordance with planning law, was consistent with a community use and, and served a good community purpose. Some of the other cases that we ran then were for a teacher in Alice Springs who had been making Facebook posts around about the time of the same-sex marriage postal ballot. And some local activists were annoyed and they complained that he was unsafe to teach children at a public school. And they raised a concern with the Ministry of Education who started to investigate him. And they also campaigned for his foster children to be taken away, all because he was not he was unsupportive of gay marriage. We also, during that time, acted for a young lady who lost her job uh, because she had posted, it's okay to say no on her Facebook page. So these cases were uh, interesting to us. And when the opportunity came to start up a law firm here in Canberra, I was approached by some of the key people at the Australian Christian Lobby who had put together some funding to, to, to start a law firm because they too were receiving many, many inquiries from Christians who were facing legal action, were being dragged through courts for hate speech or for ostensible discrimination. And so at the time I prayed about it, I talked to my wife, we, uh, and we upped sticks and moved to Canberra. That was five years ago in 2019. Uh, and that's really what started my journey here to, to be a, a litigation lawyer in a, a religious freedom firm. Excellent. So what's happened in the last decade that's given HRLA such scope for work? Well, I, I think, Andrew, we're in the middle of a distinct societal change in the West. There are many people who've written about the, the factors that are influencing where our culture is going. But I think um, Aaron Wren describes it really well, where he says that for Christianity in Western culture, it used to be positive world, where it was widely acknowledged that Christianity underpinned uh, Western society, and that all of our institutions had an acknowledgement that being a Christian was a good thing. That when you turned up to a job interview and said, I'm a member of the local community church, 
that was seen as something that stood in your favor for that job. But positive world gave way to neutral world. Uh, and Aaron Wren in, in his book about this says that that was sort of from the period of the sexual revolution in the 1960s, maybe the 1980s, until 2015. So we're talking 10 years ago, and that we've now entered into negative world. Neutral world was where Christians were considered to be um, harmless. Your Christianity wasn't particularly beneficial to you in society, but neither was it something that uh, exposed you to any sort of ridicule uh, or to any adverse action. Wren says the advent of same-sex marriage is a good waypoint and dividing point for when we go into negative world, where being a Christian is seen as harmful, where the general narrative that's being applied in our society is that Christianity is not just a strange belief system, it's also a belief system that causes harm, is not good for society. And we see this in a lot of the um, ideologies, in uh, the thinking that pervades our media, our social media, our politics, that Christians are bigots, that Christians are people who've kept down minorities, uh, and that being a Christian uh, is not a positive thing, but it's a negative thing. So do you think that Christians need more prudence today concerning their public acts and statements? Absolutely. In our work, we see Christians being brought to task in all sorts of ways for things that they have said. It used to be that Christian ethics and morality were very much in line with our legal system and the way that it worked and the general ethics and morality of our society. But we've seen a dramatic shift in that, particularly in the areas of sexuality and identity in the last uh, 10, 15 years, and indeed since the 1960s uh, and the sexual revolution. Uh, and so that means that whereas when Christians would express their beliefs or orthodox teachings of scripture on morality, in the old days, it was consistent with the community, it was consistent with the culture and wouldn't raise any eyebrows. But now as we enter a post-Christian world, as we enter this negative world, what Christians are saying does not resonate with community uh, understandings on morality and the new ethics that is pervading our culture. It's what Stephen McAlpine, uh, the Christian commentator, calls that we're living in a secular age, not a secular age, but a secular age where it is uh, completely obsessed with the individual, their sexuality, and their sexual choices, and that being given complete freedom. And a Christian ethic, particularly on that issue, is going to be out of step and sound harsh in the ears of the community. So what that means is that Christians really do uh, need to be prudent, and they need to recognize that there's a real asymmetry in public acts and statements that they can make. What I mean by asymmetry is, is that, for instance, if one is to use satire, it's perfectly okay to use satire when you are supporting one of the fashionable ideologies of the day and when you're, say, criticizing Christians. Christians are always on the receiving end of satire. But oftentimes when Christians use satire themselves in their postings, just think of things like the Babylon Bee, or the kinds of social media posts you see from some of the cultural commentators, it gets judged very harshly. And you often see people getting in trouble with regulators, with their employers, uh, when they've been standing for political office, when they have tried to use satire because the system is asymmetrical. So there really is a two-tier two system uh, that we see in the way these things are judged within the court of public opinion. And it's different depending on which ideology you are uh, supporting and from which um, tribe you come. And particularly for Christians, it's very important that we recognize we have to be careful using satire. We have to be careful expressing, expressing our position. And Christians need to know that once something's out in the public and the internet, that it's pretty much there forever. And in a culture which has become more polarized, 
and where Christian ideas seem more and more strange, Christians are going to face more and more trouble for the things that they say. So they need to be prudent. That's absolutely the case. So what, what techniques are used sometimes to silence Christians? Well, I guess we focus mainly on the legal side of things. So when a Christian is threatened with legal action, and there are ways to weaponize the law to silence Christians. Uh, vilification laws, which are like hate speech laws, are often the way that someone will say, you said something that was hateful towards me. You said something uh, that would cause other people to ridicule me and to hate me. But generally, those cases don't make it to court until about three years after the incident. What happens immediately in the aftermath of that incident is the social pressure, is the reputational pressure that is put on people. And a great example of that was the City Point Christian School Saga in 2022, where a school in Brisbane uh, circulated its enrollment contract to all of its students on the Friday before school started. And in that, it said that they were going to hold to an orthodox position on, on identity, a sex-based position where boys had to enroll as boys and girls had to enroll as girls. Released on a Friday night, by Saturday it was on Twitter, and there was a petition that was put out to censure the school and to condemn the school. By Sunday and Monday, the main stream media had programs where former students and teachers who had quit were appearing, saying this school is homophobic, this school is discriminatory, this school is, is uh, causing harm to LGBTQ kids. Then there were articles in the newspaper which misquoted and plucked out quotes from, the, from this article. During the week, politicians got involved. Uh, the Minister for Education announced that there was going to be a review of the school, and by Friday, the school had rescinded the contract and the principal had resigned. And that was effective use of social pressure to shut down a Christian organization trying to uh, run its school in accordance with its Christian beliefs. And that happens in a lot of different circumstances uh, for Christians that intensive social pressure, a lot of it aggravated by social media. I mean, we see it with some of our clients who are students at university, where they would express their hesitance in relation to LGBTQ dogma in class. They often get dragged in front of their um, department heads, uh, their, their lecturers, to say that this isn't consistent with their, their codes of conduct. We've seen this in the workplace where employees no longer just have an employment agreement. They also have a code of conduct which goes to uh, issues of what they call diversity, equity and inclusion, which effectively require them to affirm things that are inconsistent with their Christian beliefs around identity, around sexuality. Many of them are forced to wear a, a purple T-shirt on Wear It Purple Day in support of trans, say, transgender causes and the medicalization of children, things that are very, very anathema to what they believe and, and the, the convictions they have about how God created people. So we see a lot of different techniques used to silence Christians. And it doesn't help that most of the people who hold the levers of cultural power in the mainstream media, uh, in social media, in politics and in the commentariat, uh, all hold a um, antipathy towards Christianity, or uh, if it's not antipathy, it's a very much a misunderstanding or a, a lack of familiarity with what Christianity is and what Christians believe. So in the face of accusation, do you think silence is sometimes essential? Yes, I, I think it's very difficult to deal with these situations when they arise. Uh, for many Christians, it's very difficult for them to handle the pressure that they feel. I'm thinking of, say, the photographer in Western Australia who politely 
declined to do a romantic photo shoot for some lesbians. And they whipped up a social media storm against him where people were doxing his page with bad reviews and with criticism. It's hard for us uh, to understand what it's like to have to face that, to have newspapers calling and asking for interviews, to have that being in the center of that cultural eye for a moment as you effectively face that crucible uh, of public opinion. And certainly it requires a wise response. And many times I think silence can be an appropriate response. Sometimes if you respond to those who are activists, you're only going to encourage them to be more active. Um, the way that it's been described to me is if you feed a troll, it only gets bigger. But in many cases, I think people should be confident to go out on the front foot, especially if they have support. And it's really important for Christians to be parts of supportive communities. And we are called in scripture to be able to give an account when someone asks us what we believe. And so I think Christians need increasingly to be skilled in how they are going to engage on the topics that they know are controversial if they are asked. When I deal with Christians, uh, and we've had over 500 inquiries uh, from different Christian people who've faced a variety of different issues over the last five years. So we've, I've talked to a lot of people who are facing hostility. And a lot of people ask me, of those people, who did the best? You know, was it the Catholics who were the best? Was it the Protestants? How did the, the Pentecostals do? And uh, for me, what I've noticed is that it doesn't really make a difference what stream of Christianity you're from, but it really makes a difference how involved and integrated and how active you are in your Christian community. The people who bear up really well and are able to engage really well on these uh, issues of hostility where they face this pressure are people who are active living members of their local church. And that is the biggest predictor as to whether they're going to be able to weather that storm and whether they're going to be able to give a good account of what they believe. So you've had some important legal wins of late, and I know you, you were successful in Lyle Shelton's case. What were these cases and, and why were they important, John? Yeah, well, Andrew, we've been very blessed with some of the cases that we have run. There is a very small number of cases that actually end up going into a court, but when they do, they are long, they are costly, uh, and uh, they cause a lot of stress to the people involved. Uh, there's an old adage that uh, when uh, you go to court, the only person who wins is the lawyers. Uh, so going to court is a difficult thing, but we have had some very good wins. One of those was for a foster couple, Byron and Kira Hordike, who live in Western Australia. Now, they, in 2017, made an application to become foster parents through a local agency. Uh, things were going very, very well for them. They had two of their own children and room in their home for more. They were part of a great supportive Christian community, but they were given a number of worksheets as part of that assessment. Towards the end of the assessment, one of those asking them their opinion on what they would do if a child came home from school crying because they'd been caught kissing someone of the same sex. They answered that saying that, well, we believe that homosexuality is a sin. And so we couldn't encourage the child and such a child wouldn't be an appropriate foster match for us. But they were confused why they got asked that question, because they were only applying for children under the age of five years old and to be temporary foster carers, namely taking the children for weekends or taking emergency care children for one week or one month, where the kind, that kind of situation around sexuality just simply wouldn't arise. Nonetheless, when the foster care agency heard their answer, they terminated their application. They rejected them saying that they were unsafe to be foster carers. And they came to us and we took their case. 
Uh, it was a long, arduous hearing, but eventually we were successful in arguing that what they faced was religious discrimination, that uh, the agency had unfairly treated them as a result of their adverse views about people of the Christian faith, and that that was unfair. So we have now a legal decision, a positive one, establishing uh, religious discrimination and the terms in which that was made. And that's really important for other couples who are going to be looking in the future to be right. uh, involved in the foster care system. Yep. You talked about the case we did for Lyle Shelton. Now, Lyle's um, a pretty public figure. He was the face of the No campaign during the marriage, uh, same-sex marriage plebiscite. And he was also the head of the Australian Christian Lobby and now uh, head of a political party, the family first political party. His case involved vilification. So he wasn't taking a case himself. He was taken <laughs> to court by two drag queens who said that he had subjected them uh, to a hateful speech when he said that they were unsafe to be telling stories to children in a Brisbane library. And he said that they were not good role models because they exposed children to dangerous gender fluid ideology. So this is in the context of a drag queen story time. I think many people are now aware that these things happen on a regular basis in Australia where drag queens tell sort of stories about gender fluidity and um, children who are girls but want to be boys in a public library and everyone comes in and listens to them. There was one of these events held in Brisbane Public Library and Lyle wrote a blog opposing this and put it on his Facebook page. Uh, and these drag queens took a vilification claim saying that what he said incited hatred, uh, ridicule and contempt for them. So we defended that claim. Uh, we were able to really uh, get a good, solid legal team for Lyle. And that's really important. It's the same with the uh, Hordikes. Oftentimes, Christians uh, face a, um, a, a different standard of resource that they can bring to these cases. And a lot of the early religious discrimination claims, you had a very well-resourced complainant and a Christian who didn't have a good lawyer, didn't have good counsel or um, the proper resources to be able to properly defend the claim. We're here to change that. And we did that for the Hordikes and we did it for Lyle. So we had a senior KC, Anthony Morris from Brisbane, who's a famous barrister who does a lot of these freedom cases. He was our counsel in that case. We had a really good junior barrister, Simon Fisher, who's a great uh, Christian man and who uh, was very good in running the case. And we were able to access a lot of really good experts in this case who were able to talk about the clear evidence that drag queen story times are bad for kids. We were even able to get Kira Bell, a detransitioner, a young woman who uh, went uh, was confused and was, went down a medical intervention path, pathway, which included the removal of her breasts at 18 years old, who by 21 years old deeply regretted what she had done, knew that she was actually a woman and now has um, desisted from identifying as a man. And she gave evidence about the, the damage that's been done to her. So this was a very good case in which we had very good counsel, very good experts. And that's important because that's the way that you get very good results that protect other Christians. And in the end, in Lyle's case, we were successful in defending that case. We had a decision in the middle of last year from uh, the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And the tribunal said that they drag queens had not proven that what uh, Lyle said was hate speech. So a really good win for Lyle. It's now under appeal. And we expect that we're going to have that appeal heard towards the end of this year. Uh, we do have the momentum going in, obviously, when you've won the case, when you're going into an appeal. But it's going to mean that the journey is not over for Lyle yet. And this will be a four or five year journey for him where the process is the punishment. Many times the cases themselves are taken to make an example out of someone, to make an example out of Lyle so that other Christians are less likely 
to be public and open with what they say. So um, it's important that we win those cases for people like Lyle so that we give courage to Christians to speak in the public square on all of the issues where the gospel penetrates, including issues uh, where we are out of step with the society. So you've spoken in the past, John, about the problems with the conversion therapy prohibition legislation. Do you think this subject has been deliberately misrepresented to gain an advantage for those that oppose the Christian faith? Yeah, absolutely. There is no question that what has happened with this conversion therapy legislation is a bait and switch. So originally when conversion therapy legislation was being promulgated, when it was being promoted, by LGBT activists, it was said that there were these horrific practices in the past which were aversion therapies. In other words, where someone has same-sex attraction, you give them electric shocks or you put them into an ice bath or you give them treatments which are going to be involve pain to try to prompt a suppression of those urges. That was the sort of methodology or the, the treatment or therapy that was being roundly condemned, and rightly so, because those kinds of treatments are not effective, and they are certainly not the kinds of treatments that Christians were doing. In fact, Christians wouldn't even call any of the ministry that they do therapy, let alone conversion therapy or treatment. It would be pastoral care and counseling to Christians who are sinful uh, on a variety of fronts, including on sexuality and identity. Now, when these laws were introduced, it became very clear that they were targeting Christians who might help people who have unwanted same-sex attraction or who have gender confusion or identity confusion. And so these laws, particularly the ones in Victoria, talked almost exclusively in the lead-up to Christian conversion therapy. They talked about prayer and wanted to make prayer illegal, pastoral counsel, parental counsel to children who are struggling with issues of identity and sexuality. And there's no question that the main aim of this legislation is not to, re to remove a harm that was being done to people who are in a vulnerable position, but has been done to silence the Christian teaching on sexuality and morality uh, that is imparted in our homes, that is imparted in our churches, and that is imparted in our schools. And this is to the great detriment of vulnerable children, because I firmly believe, and I think there's plenty of evidence for this, that the safest place for a vulnerable child who's confused about who they are is being raised in a Christian home going to a Christian school and under the counsel of Christian pastors. Those people will turn out happier, stronger, more resilient, more sure of who they are than those who are exposed to other ideas, particularly around the medical interventions for people with gender confusion. Just before we go to the next question, I might mention to our viewers that if you have a question that you'd like to put to John about matters that he's raised today or indeed other matters, you can send those in while we're talking. And at the end of our questions, uh, we'll ask John, can he examine those? My colleague in, in Western Australia, Daryl Budge, will monitor those and present those to John, and he'll be glad to answer those. So you've spoken recently, John, concerning uh, the case of Gillian Spencer, who's been taken to task with the Queensland Human Rights Commission, uh, who's a doctor. You've mentioned that she will argue that the imposition of the requirement to adopt a gender affirmation approach is incompatible with human rights, limiting her freedom of thought, conscience and belief her right to hold an opinion without interference and to impart ideas. Do you think at this stage, and it's only obviously we haven't even started yet, but do you think she's got a good case? 
Andrew, her case gets better by the day as the supposed scientific foundation for medical interventions, what's called the gender affirmation model for children, <clears throat> becomes more and more shaky. We've got now very good high quality studies. We've got very good reviews, most recently the CAS review that came out of the UK. Right. That says that there is no good evidence for medically intervening with a child who is, faces gender confusion. That is, giving them puberty blockers shouldn't be done. Giving them hormones, cross-sex hormones or wrong-sex hormones shouldn't be done. And certainly irreversible surgeries should not be done. There is no compelling case for uh, engaging in those. Now, Dr. Gillian Spencer is a very experienced psychiatrist. So a medical doctor specializing in the brain and in um, the uh, pathologies of the brain. And she's been working with children and adolescents for the last 20 years. And she's seen this whole gender movement start from one or two children, usually male, appearing at the gates of the hospital, usually with other traumas in their life, uh, other issues going on, who had confusion about their sex. Within five, 10, 15 years, it's now hundreds, mainly girls, two to one usually girls, who are going through a dedicated clinic, which is staffed by people who only believe in an affirmation model in medical intervention, who believe that this whole process should be patient-led so that the child dictates who they are and what they should get, and um, which is causing them irreversible damage. And so the case that Gillian is bringing is to say that the imposition of political ideology on her is discrimination because she wants to use an evidence-led clinical um, basis, clinical practice for when she engages with children, not to be dictated to by the child, what the child says they are, but to go through and do an assessment, take a holistic approach that is multidisciplinary and look at all the factors that go into this. And so this case is going to be difficult. There have been very few cases where there has been open criticism of the gender affirmation model, or most of them have been shut down. There have been a lot of attempts to have a review of the practices of the gender clinics in Australia, most of almost all of which have been shut down. The federal government, the former um, coalition government, refused to try to make this an issue, even though it's probably the, one of the most pressing issues of our time. So we're hopeful that Gillian's case is going to give her the freedom to be able to practice medicine without that political and inter ideological interference for the benefit of children. And if she wins her case, this gives courage to a whole bunch of other medical practitioners who are very, very uncomfortable with what's happening to our children, but are afraid of the consequences should they speak out. So it's a very important case and we're privileged to be able to take it. One of the interesting things about it, Andrew, is this, is that Gillian isn't even a Christian. She's just an everyday Aussie mum. And oftentimes these people, these secular people who are have just have common sense and a lot of courage, have been much braver than Christians, much braver than the church and much braver than our pastors in talking about this issue and identifying it as a real issue where we need to be protecting our children. And so where a lot of Christians have failed, there are others who are stepping into that gap. And Dr. Gillian Spencer is one of them. All right. So what trends do we need to be aware of here in Australia in 2024? Oh, look, Andrew, there are so many different trends that are happening. I mean, one of the most, um, uh, uh, lots of talk is given about the fact that we are polarizing as a society. Uh, that we're seeing a breakdown of civil discussion between different groups 
that we're having a narrower and narrower um, range of views that are acceptable to hold in public. I mean, it used to be that if you talked about what you think is happening on the temperature gauge, no one would really much care. And it wouldn't be something that would either hold you up for approval or be something that would mean that you would be um, uh, sort of subject to, to sort of uh, hostility. But now with climate change, hysteria, anyone's opinions on this must correspond with the prevailing views. Otherwise, you are declared anathema. But one of the things that's not talked about very much is technology. And technology has really changed and exacerbated many of the underlying problems that were always there. So social media is one of the big places where people have now become ultra polarized and where the things that people say are, are now preserved forever. And so Christians engaging on social media need to be very careful. <laughs> but more than social media is the ability of government, of institutions to track, to record, and to um, be able to impose sanctions on you, not just government, but large corporations. So we have clients whose Twitter accounts have been shut down. Many Christians have been the subject of Facebook um, regulation where all of a sudden their posts can't be seen anymore. And what we're seeing increasingly overseas is this concept of called debanking. Have you heard of debanking? Yes. It's where a bank stops and suspends services to people who are deemed to hold views that are not acceptable uh, or which are deemed to be harmful and dangerous. So with the technologies that we now have, it allows a far more authoritarian overreach into the lives of all Australian citizens, but particularly Christians who fall afoul of the spirit of the age. And that's something we're increasingly going to see. We're also seeing the politicization of everything. It used to be that corporations couldn't care less what party you voted for or what your views were on the contentious issues. They stayed out of that. But now all of these large corporations have a huge adjunct wing of people called diversity officers and marketing officers and social connection officers. And their main job is to police all of these contentious issues and make sure that they are on the right side, the woke side of history. And that's going to be a great problem for people who show true diversity of thought and opinion, and particularly Christian people who work within those organizations. One of the things that we're also seeing as a trend is the increasing use of harm arguments. So it used to be that when a Christian said something that was that 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 got them offside with a particular group. Say you said something nasty about homosexuals, or even something true um, about a homosexual group, but which didn't sound nice. People would say, "You've offended me." That I find that offensive. But notice that in the last 10, 15 years, that message has more changed to not just "You've offended me," and I my personal feelings are hurt. It is. You have harmed me. You have not only harmed me, but you've caused great mental anguish to my community. And so what you're saying is not just nasty, it's actually harmful and bad. And that has led to a lot of legislation being proposed, particularly around speech, which sees speech as causing actual harms. And that harm narrative is a difficult one to push back against. But one of the things Christians can be doing is making sure that they themselves don't fall into the trap of using that harm narrative. Are talking about how when someone insults or offends them, that it actually causes them harm. Um, so th those are just some of the of the trends <clears throat> that we're seeing. But there are so many different factors that are influencing uh, the hostility against Christians that we're seeing in our society. Certainly the secularization of our society uh, has been something that has contributed to um, Christians now being fa facing the um, opprobrium of our community. But I think that is a transition point towards a neo-paganism. And so we're really seeing that people are not becoming less spiritual, but more. 
we're seeing the uh, more and more the engagement with and the endorsement of pagan cultures. So not only are we seeing the elevation of Aboriginal people, we're seeing the endorsement of Aboriginal religion. Uh, and that is ultimately a pagan religion, which Christians will have some serious concerns about. But we're seeing it in the, um, the worship of nature. A lot of the environmental movement is going back to a, a sort of animistic um, uh, sort of outlook on the world. We have places in the West where um, uh, the environment that is give, being given uh, legal rights and legal personhood, where mountains are recognized as legal persons whose rights need to be taken into account in decisions. So I think another trend is that slip towards neo-paganism. Everyone's religious. No one can say they truly don't have any views on these things. And when one religion vacates the stage, such as Christianity, which has been such a pervasive influence on the West, another one will take its place. So having said all that, John, uh... Do you think Christians need to speak up today with greater confidence? Yes, I think the answer is that Christians uh, now need to be more prepared to speak and give that positive message of why Christianity is good for the world, why all of the benefits that we see in our modern society didn't just appear out of the Enlightenment didn't just appear out of the ideas of atheists or out of technological pro progress, but that these things have their roots in Christianity. Uh, a great book that describes this very well is The Air We Breathe by Glenn Scrivener or Scrivener, who's an Australian academic now in London, who talks about how all of the things that we talk about in modern society, like justice, like fairness, like equality, these are things that if you went back to first century Rome would seem strange in their ears because they didn't believe in them. They only came into Western culture through Christianity. And yet now we use these terms in a way where we have rejected the root, the root of Christianity. And if we reject the root, we soon won't have that fruit. And we're seeing the society around us crumble. We're seeing real concerns around mental health around cohesion in our society because we've cut off that root of Christianity and it needs Christians to obey the call of scripture to be a salt and a light in their communities. They can't sit there in their churches in a salt shaker. They need to be rubbed into that meat to be adding flavor, to be preserving. And one of the ways they can do that is to be speaking up with confidence uh, where God has placed them. However, they're not all Christians are called to speak. Some aren't very good at speaking, and some people, when they open their mouths, don't do the cause of Christianity uh, much good. So you need to be wise and get a lot of advice from people around you. Are you the person to speak on these issues? Because some people should be told that they shouldn't speak. They should be praying. <laughs> yep. So th for those who are wishing to venture into the public sphere, and that's certainly some of us, what kind of encouragements you know, would you give to those believers? I think it's easy as Christians engaging in a post-Christian culture to be very defensive. So we can almost not believe that what we hold on to is good news and truth that is not just used to protect our own patch as Christians, but is also good for the society around us. Right. So I think a confidence that we are speaking truth, a confidence that the truth will win out. Of course, underlying that confidence is a confidence in God. I mean, the, the thing that gives me the most confidence and encouragement is knowing that as a Bible-believing Christian, I've read the last page and I know who wins. I don't know what happens in the pages in between, but I know that God's plans will come to fruition and that he is leading towards an end where he comes back in glory and all I have to do is faithfully serve him. And then he tells me that when I'm called before 
this world to give account of what I believe, the Holy Spirit will strengthen me and give me the words to say. Yep. Another great comfort. There are also some practical things that I think Christians need to know. The first is when you're dealing with any issue, whether it be an issue around um, sexuality or identity or the environment or um, Aboriginal culture or whatever are the, uh, um, the domestic violence, whatever issue is on the table as the pressing issue of the day, oftentimes what's being spoken about overtly is not the main game. So what we're seeing sometimes is Christians engaging with something like same-sex marriage, for instance, and saying, well, as a Christian, I believe in equality and I want my neighbor to be treated the same as I do. And I understand and fully believe in his dignity as a fellow human being. And so I will vote in favor of the, ma the marriage franchise being extended to that neighbor who is in a same-sex relationship, not realizing that this joins a trajectory where following on from that, we've had a foray into children's rights, the promotion of LGBTQ to children, drag queen story times, the rise of transgender medicine and the medical interventions with children. So making sure we know that we're always only ever at a waypoint rather than at an end point and having the wisdom to know that today's battle is just part of a, a big war. It's not the war itself. And so being wise and discriminating in the best way, discerning is probably a better word than discriminating because that's got a bad a pejorative sense to it. Wise in the way that we engage on these issues and look at where it's leading and what the underlying ideas are. And the last thing I would say is that Christians engaging in the public square need to exercise linguistic discipline. So oftentimes, we are using terminology and language that is not ours. Conversion therapy is a great example of that. It links one word conversion, which is a very Christian word, with a medical word therapy and makes a neologism, a new term. I don't like using the term conversion therapy because I don't think it's a real term. It's an ideological term that's used to, to uh, fog the truth. Uh, and to confuse people as to what it is trying to actually introduce. Another term is gender. I mean, I talk about real things. I talk about real things like sex. Uh, to me, gender is not a real term. It doesn't have a fixed meaning. And when you're discussing this with activists, you will find that when you're talking about gender, say, as how Western people uh, express their sex, like a man will wear a suit and a girl will wear and a woman will wear a dress. The person who's talking about gender on the other side of you is talking about something completely different and trying to infuse it with their own meaning. Right. So that if you start using their terms, you're in a battle or in a game with rules that mean that you will lose. An example of that would be, how come Christian schools hate trans kids? How come Christian schools discriminate against trans kids might be a question you get. There is no such thing as a trans kid. There are children who are confused. That is an appropriate diagnosis. And schools have regularly, Christian schools have been the most pastoral place where those kids can have an atmosphere of safety where schools look after them. But to call a child trans is to give a prescription, is to give a diagnosis to some symptoms which may not hold, which do not hold, and we're seeing don't hold. So we shouldn't say, no, 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 no. We as Christian schools love trans kids and support trans kids. Using the term trans kids means that you've already lost the battle, which is why it is so important to exercise linguistic discipline, to be careful about the words that we use. And the last thing is, is just to really be confident in the truth even as people around you uh, are ridiculing you, are saying that what you're saying is backwards, phobic, you're a troglodyte, you're a mouth breather, all of these kinds of insults that often come to Christians who stand for orthodox beliefs is to remain firmly standing in the truth, recognizing that this is not a battle against people. 
It's a battle against ideas, against spiritual ideas and spiritual forces. And so we've got to be armed with the armor of, of God, the, that spiritual armor. Excellent. That's been very good, John. Thank you. We've got a few minutes now for us to take any questions that may have come in. Uh, my good colleague, Daryl, do you have any do you have any of those questions over in your neck of the woods that have come in that, that you can moderate for us? Yes, thank you, uh, Andrew. And thanks, John, for your excellent points. It's very helpful. Um, Adrian asks, thank you for your heart for this vital work in regards to achieving a legal precedence in one jurisdiction, state or territory. Does that carry decisive value in other jurisdictions? That's a good question. The answer is it depends. And that's the lawyer. The lawyer's answer you'll always get is never a yes or no, it depends. Yes, many of the decisions we get will have persuasive weight in different jurisdictions, some more than others. As we take cases that go to higher courts, they're going to have higher precedent value. So while, say, in a case like Lyle Shelton's, where it's disappointing that we've seen an appeal of that decision, the fact that it's appealed means that if we win that case again, and I'm very hopeful and prayerful that we will, the case will have more precedential value uh, in future hate speech cases uh, and will be beneficial to Christians. Yes. Uh, and somebody else asks, Andrew Thorburn, the then CEO of Essendon Football Club, was pressured to resign, not for something that he actually said, but because his church had Christian views on human sexuality. Do you see this as an escalation of the persecution of Christians insofar as he was handed out for guilt by association rather than something he even had said? Yes, absolutely. The interesting thing was many Christians have been very critical of other Christians who get in trouble. And in fact, one of the things I should have said that we need to be aware of is that often the opposition you will face if you stand up for the gospel will be most harsh from other Christians. And so when Israel Folau spoke, for instance, many people criticized him for not being nuanced enough. Uh, when the Manly Sevens wouldn't wear the rugby jersey, many people pointed to their contract and said, well, they're contractually obliged, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that if they had uh, engaged in a better way and been more reasonable, then they wouldn't have uh, faced the societal pressure that they did. But in Andrew Thorburn's case, it's very clear that no matter how much you have accommodated um, to the society. Uh, there are certain things that are going to mean that you are persona non grata. Regardless, he didn't say anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. In fact, when he was the chairman of NAB, he had been vocally supportive of things like same-sex marriage and the kinds of equality rounds that they have in the AFL. Uh, so it's very clear that if you give ground on these issues, that it's just going to be pushed further and further. As I said before, these things are only ever waypoints. And it shows that increasingly, it doesn't matter how urbane and how um, engaging and how careful you are in what you say, if you are not in step with the particular ideologies that are popular right now and which every <laughs> right-thinking person is supposed to hold, if you're Andrew Thorburn, and you went to a church that was critical of abortion and critical of homosexuality, that's it. You are going to face uh, this cancel culture. And he did. And even though he got a apology from uh, the Essendon Football Club, it's been profoundly impacting for him. I mean, he lost jobs on boards. He lost future employment. And um, that all because of the way uh, that he was treated at Essendon, which was deeply, deeply unfair. I have a personal question. So regards to leadership from the Christian church in Australia, for example, um, yes, the founding that the Christian church itself and the pastoral leaders and stuff have become more, less and less reluctant to speak up in support together as coalition of churches and things like that. And very few media releases even going out from church representatives. The Catholic Church does very well at this, but the Protestant Church is quite weak. What do you think is the reasons for this and how can we change it? 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I'm a church man myself. I love my church. I love my pastor. Uh, and yet I see, I feel that pastors, particularly in Protestant churches, uh, have, with very few exceptions, sort of missed the the missed the opportunities that are there. I think what causes it is that pastors are not in day-to-day contact with the culture that they're in. So you're somewhat insulated as a pastor from what your parishioners, what the person in the pew is facing in their workplace, facing at their university, facing in the public service, facing when they try to rent a school hall, you know, for a for a Christian group. Also, pastors, I think, sometimes have a narrow view of the gospel, that it it's only per, it's only um, application really is to the personal souls of each individual person, that the gospel doesn't have a dimension that speaks to all of society. Um, they're too much like the Apostle Paul in the early chapters of Acts, just trying to spread the gospel to people, when we need to also be like the Apostle Paul in the later part of Acts, where he's speaking to Felix, where he's speaking to the authorities, where he appeals to Caesar and makes public statements of where Christianity is at odds with the uh, contemporary culture. And I think because pastors are uniquely isolated from uh, the culture, so they can't be fired because they speak out on these issues. Um, they, I guess they can face a bit of cancel culture, but they've got a church that largely supports them and which is looking to them for guidance. <clears throat> they should be some of the loudest voices, particularly when it came to issues such as conversion therapy, where you had laws which directly reached into uh, the work that pastors are called to do, shepherding the flock. Another angle in terms of what's happening as a trend in society is we've seen more and more disconnection from children from their parents like they're spending yeah. less and less time with their own parents and i think that reflects a trend of as people growing up they come out more and more continuous infantilization of that person's worldview that they see everything as a an emotional threat to themselves because they've had very little emotional intelligence upbringing with their own personal parents and very little maybe time spent in touch and and time spent with their parents that gives them a grounding in those essential emotional intellectual kind of worldview things yes and um they don't have uh siblings anymore they don't even have mm -hmm. cousins they yeah. don't have aunts and uncles so it, it is a real problem is firstly um the triumph of the psychologized individual and the failure of modern parenting techniques to teach children obedience, resilience, self-control, all of the kinds of self-regulation that children need to have to be able to function in the world. And so we have these very fragile children going out into the world, expecting everything to be adjusted to them. We're giving them trigger warnings everywhere. We're seeing the Peter Pan syndrome where children don't grow up until they're 40. Uh, and it's not good for society, and it exacerbates some of the things that we're seeing in that victim mentality, that harm mentality that I talked about. The other thing is is the imposition of the state. I mean, I think all of these things that we're seeing are part of a larger movement to destroy our mediating institutions. In other words, the institu institutions that stand between a person and the government. And we're moving towards a system where family influence is diminished, church influence is diminished, social group influence is diminished, and we're all pulling out of um, these intermediary um, things, even like political parties. No one's in political parties anymore. Uh, and all of that is thus reducing us to a bunch of individuals who are governed by, where every aspect of our life is governed by the state. And that too is completely contrary to what the Bible says is good for human flourishing that on the contrary these things uh, a lot of the responsibility falls on fathers and mothers and families and family groupings uh, to raise children and to have a healthy society and i think we're seeing this come out 
in the incredible, you know, mental, what they call it mental health, uh, anxiety, depression, all of the these um, things that are just wrong with our children where they are at unprecedented rates. The domestic violence crisis, I think there's a real sense in which one of the contributing factors is that we haven't raised our young men with learn, teaching them obedience, teaching them resilience, teaching them that they can't have what they want immediately and teaching them proper emotional regulation. Not, not only that, but also the other issues that we're talking about, such as respect for women, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things, I think, are part and parcel of interlocking um, issues. I'm probably going well outside um, the narrow focus of religious freedom, but it all links together, Daryl. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we'll, I've, I've got a quote from Mother Teresa. I think if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. And for us as Family Voice, I think it's it's quite essential that that's what we as individuals do. If we have a, a, a good nuclear family that loves each other and cares for each other, then I can go and change my neighborhood. I can go and change my town. I can go with my church. I love other families in my church if my family loves each other. Yes. And, and one of the things I often talk to people about is I say, if you want to do something that is going to be really good for our society and be an influence, it is to, to as a man, I'm often talking to men, love your wife, have lots of children with her and obey that command to be fruitful and multiply because we live in a culture of death where families are supposed to be small, Absolutely. where people are very selfish about the number of children that they have. Now, not everyone can do that. Um, there is the other command to rule and subdue the earth that everyone can do. But I think if you can reject the cultural imposition on you to say your career is more important than children, uh, the family is not as important as your social climbing, uh, really, uh, we should be as Christians, a, a culture of life, have lots of children, raise them in the knowledge of God, raise them in a godly environment and send them out into the world to do the same again and to be a um, influence and a, and a, and a salt and a light to the, to the community Amen and to our to culture. That. Amen. Thanks, John. I think we've reached the end of our time, Andrew. So we'll wrap up there. Yes. Well, thank you, Daryl. And thank you, John, for a marvellous uh, time with you today. It's been very helpful, very beneficial for our listeners, I'm sure. And uh, we look forward to, to talking to you again sometime. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, if people want to support us, please go see our website, sign up for our newsletters, uh, and please make donations because the way we're able to help people uh, and Christians who face hostility is through the generosity uh, of Christians. Excellent. All the best. God bless you, John.